tell us a little bit about the Fania All Stars. The Fania All Stars is basically the, the 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 super group of salsa. So it's basically all the all the band leaders in salsa music get together to to make one one group, one super group. So. In other words, as opposed to like, you know, like rock and roll music is, is pretty, you know, usually you have the, the singer and like a lead guitarist or, and one of those two is usually, generally speaking, the, uh, the driving force or the band leader or something. And salsa, mu- salsa music is more like jazz in that, in that uh, the person composing the music and the band leader could be, could be any of them. So sometimes it's just the, sometimes it's the maraca player. And he's writing bass parts and piano parts and horn parts for everybody. But on the ensemble, he's just a maraca player. So you'll have a maraca player that's a band leader. You'll have a, a, a conga player that's a band leader, Ray Barreto. You'll have a trombone player that's a band leader, Willy Colon. You'll have, you know, so you get the idea. They'll take all the band leaders and make a group. So, so, so it's basically essentially a super group where all the, all the best players are and definitely all the best singers are. And how were you introduced to people like Larry Harlow and Eddie Palmieri? Uh, just through growing up, you know, it's just, uh, I mean, those are, those are salsa legends, you know. Uh, Palmieri in particular because he's Puerto Rican. Harlow, Harlow is more of a strange case because he, he's a, this uh, New York Jewish man who went to Cuba to study salsa music and became a phenomenon. But, uh, but Eddie and Charlie Palmieri are kind of like the, well, not kind of, they're the, they're the pride of, of Puerto Rico, you know. And the live at the University of Puerto Rico record is one of the first ones that you uh, got into as a kid. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, all, all those records, you know, were always around uh, because that's just, that's our music, you know. So growing up in Puerto Rico, and even, and even when we moved to, uh, to Mexico, we still only listened to salsa music. Shit, even when we moved to America, we were still only listening to salsa music. So those are, those are just part of the household, you know. Uh, what about when you got older, when you became a teenager and you're in El Paso? Um, what are some of the early records that you bought at Metal Storm? Metal Storm. Well, my very f- the very first record I can remember getting was a uh, was a uh, uh, Overkill. This band called Overkill, like some metal band. The Fuck You EP. The fu- The Fuck You record. Yeah, and I had <laughs> I got it just because it said Fuck You. I thought that was so crazy at the time. This middle finger. So I got it, and and uh, and then I realized reading the liner notes as. as as you do when you're, you know, when you're, when you're into stuff, and obviously before the internet. So, when I'm reading the liner notes, it, it has the, uh, the the publishing credits on it, and I realize that it's just a cover song. And it's this whole other band called DOA, and I said, DOA, what's that? So I started doing research and found DOA and found kids that were into DOA, and then I learned about Black Flag and Dead Kennedys, basically the skaters, you know, uh, and skateboarding, and so it all sort of snowballed from there. <laughs> Since we're speaking of childhood, I have a quote for you. Um, if you want your children to be intelligent, read them fairy tales. If, if you, you want, want them, them to be even more intelligent, <laughs> read them more, more fairy, fairy tales. tales. Albert Einstein. What are your thoughts? That's yeah, definitely. I mean, he's definitely right. I mean, he also says, you know, imagination is everything, and that's the, you know, it's more powerful than knowledge. And so, yeah, it's. I couldn't agree more. What kind of fairy tales were you read as a kid? Uh, well, my my mother and father had this funny thing where they invented their fairy tales so they were being creative about things that are already pretty creative in and of themselves <laughs> you know so uh you know obviously like you, you you know you little red riding hood and all that stuff but for the most part my father and mother would make up fairy tales every night and so they always would say that it would that it would uh it would cause for an interesting it would cause an interesting situation because they said i was a kid i was so obsessive that the minute they were done with the fairy tale i wouldn't be asleep and i'd say okay again and so they, I'd ask him to repeat it the whole thing again. And as soon as he would start to deviate because he had made it up, you know, I'd say, no, that's not how it went. He went to the castle first and then he got, you know, so it, it's kind of uh, funny. But, you know, that's just how my parents were, are. You know. uh, was there ever fairy tale time as you got older with uh, your younger brother Rico? Or did you ever read fairy tales to him? To Rico? No, I just more played pranks on him or, or just... Uh, would have them hang out sometimes, you know, when we were recording music and stuff. I, I wasn't too too good of an older brother at that point, you know, when he was little. I was always gone at the time, so I, I, I had a I had left home at an early age, just kind of 
took off and, and then started doing, you know, the whole touring thing with at the drive-in. And so I wasn't around for much. But when, when I would come back home, you know, we it was more like uh, sharing comic books and sharing records and things like that. Speaking of your brothers, I did an interview with uh, Zex Marquis in 2010. And one of the things they mentioned was being able to witness one of the very first at the drive-in shows ever done at a neighbor's garage in El Paso. Yeah. Um, in retrospect, are there garage shows or backyard shows that stick out to you today? Uh, from from back then, I mean, yeah, I mean, they, they all do because that was just sort of the... <laughs> that was just sort of the thing back then, so I guess, you know, that that one definitely sticks out. Uh, any of the ones during wintertime stick out just because it was really cold or any of the ones that that got busted, you know, by the cops always stick out because having to load your gear out in a hurry, you know, it sort of sticks uh, sticks in your mind. Where were some of the most obscure places that you played without the drive-in? Oh, man. I mean, we played we played everywhere. So, uh, so I... That's a weird sound. So, so I, so I would, I wouldn't, sorry. Uh, I wouldn't know what, I mean, they all seem so obscure to me now, but I, I, you know, like I never knew what, and I would, I would hate to insult someone, you know, who's from there and have them say like, oh, what do you mean? That's not obscure. But at the time having toured and stuff, I, I never knew before we hit these places like where, you know, Missoula, Montana was or, or, uh, uh, Oh, there's a really great one in North Dakota. Uh, I can't remember right now. Sorry, my, my memory's failing me. My memory's really failing me right now. Minot, North Dakota. That was really obscure. And it was an amazing, amazing show. We played there several times. But I had never known of that city until until, uh, until I got there. I mean, I, I learned more about obscure places when I was a teenager and I went hitchhiking across the country. That's I got stuck on every single little town, you know, Eli, Eli, Nevada, uh, Austin, Utah, you know, just like these weird small, small towns where I would, you know, wash dishes for a couple of days until I could, uh, you know, get some money to eat and move on. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, it's, you know, America is such a big country. I guess a lot of the places could be obscure that aren't, you know, the sort of mentioned, the big cities that are, everyone knows about. How long did you hitchhike across the country? Uh, for about a year. A little less than a year yeah. and then you ended up back home in El Paso yeah while we're talking about at the drive-in I did an interview with Ross Robinson in 2009 um, and one of the things he said was that at the drive-in initially didn't want to work with him he said that uh, it, Limp Bizkit was the Antichrist at the time yeah um, in retrospect what are some things some lessons that you learned from working with Ross Robinson that still apply to today oh man I mean, there, there was a lot. There was a lot. I, you know, I mean, we for for everything that happened, we, we really did learn a lot working with him, and, and it was a it was an eye opening experience. You know, uh, we had we had generally just worked with sort of more uh, uh, people who were more <laughs> people who, who were more uh, engineers and things like that. And he was the first person who really like sort of started messing with our arrangements. You know, and re- really did produce us in every sense of the every sense of the word. Um, and so I guess that was a big lesson, is just learning to sort of let go and, and trust somebody. And another big lesson would be to always pay attention, you know, so, you know. <laughs> uh, you also worked with Rick Rubin um, for the first Mars Volta record. Yeah. Um, so when you're working in the mansion, where, did you ever come across any supernatural experiences up in Laurel Canyon? Oh, sure. Yeah, yeah, so at, least, uh, at least we thought they were supernatural. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, the, the, the place just had a... You know, like locking all the wind, you know, locking the windows and putting the latches on at nighttime because you were freaked out to be up there by yourself. And then in the morning they were unlatched and completely open, you know. Oh. But it was usually just things like that, things that we would freak out about it and, and be like, you know, go over to Cedric Shroom and bring them back and say, you saw me lock these, right? And you saw me put the latch all the way down. There's no way it could just blow open, right? And he'd say, yeah, there's no way it could say, okay, I'm switching rooms, you know, like just little things like that, so... On the topic of the Mars Volta, um, I know the Mars Volta is pretty much, you know, it's, it's your, you're kind of dictating the Mars Volta in a sense. It's like your project. Uh, but with Bosnian Rainbows, it seems as if it's more of a collaborative effort. Um, tell us a little bit about how that project formed and is control really a sickness? Uh, yeah, of course it is. Yeah. Control, trying to control everything all the time is definitely a sickness. Uh, and, uh, 
And, uh, yeah, and then Bosnia and Rainbow started exactly that as an exercise in, uh, in, in, uh, in, in going back to the group mentality, you know, like what we had without the driving, you know, in a true collaborative effort, you know, a true group. And so that was the concept I started with, and I wanted to, I wanted to put together a band where everyone in the band, sort of like we were talking about the Fania, uh, where everyone in the band was a band leader. In other words, where everyone in the band had no reason to take orders from anyone else, you know, and there's no, like, hired musicians or anything. It was like every, everyone was a band leader, and everybody had all the reason in the world to do their own thing. So making it more of a, of a band situation, meaning that like you've got to really want to be here in order to do it, because if not, you could just be doing your own thing. And uh, so, the, so sort of the guidelines were that everybody, you know, every, that everybody be a writer, a composer, everybody be a producer, and everybody be an engineer, meaning that everybody knows how to record themselves and make tracks and propose things. And so, uh, and so you know, so, so, uh, you know, so I asked the Anthony and, 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 and Nick and, and Terry to be in the band and... And uh, and then we just we, we took it from there, you know. And we all fit together uh, quite nicely, you know. And and that's the thing. Again, you know, Terry has the butcheress, whereas her thing, you know, she could she has no reason to be here unless she absolutely wants to. Nick Nicky Casper has no reason to be here unless he absolutely wants to. The, the Anthony Parks also, you know, it, it makes for for an interesting chemistry.